Good afternoon. Welcome to SCA's webinar with Bob Barbet on identifying economic refract candidates in the Eastern and Southern Midland Basins. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of the audience. So I'm going to launch one of the polling questions. And the first question is, what is your primary discipline? We're starting to see responses, lots of petroleum engineers in the audience. Got a few geoscientists as well. They're still voting. All right. Still collecting a few votes. Looks like um, the majority are petroleum engineers. Let me go ahead and close the poll and share the results. 57% uh, petroleum engineers, <clears throat> excuse me, 29% geoscientists, 14% other. So let's go to the next polling question. How many years of full-time experience do you have? Starting to get the results back. It's like we have some in every category. So it looks like most of you have more than 30 years experience, but we actually have uh, at least one response in every category. Responses are still coming in. It's like a pretty well distributed audience. And it looks like most of you have voted so I'm going to go ahead and close and share the results. We have 31% with over 30 years experience. And uh, there's someone in each of that other categories. Looks like maybe only one person in the less than one year. So thank you for uh, your responses. It helps Bob to calibrate his presentation towards the audience. So I'd like to remind the audience that you are muted today, but you can ask questions throughout the presentation using the GoToWebinar question feature. We'll cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation and you will be anonymous. So go ahead and, and start uh, loading your questions throughout the presentation. So today's presentation includes Bob Barbet, he started his career with Schlumberger, and he's worked in the area of formation evaluation on fields throughout North America and indeed across the world. He has quite a bit of experience in refract candidates, and that's going to be the topic of today's presentation in the Eagleford and Southern Midland Basin. So this relates to a class that Bob teaches for SCA. It's offered in a couple of different formats. The live online classes are provided in half-day uh, formats, generally offered in the morning time in North America. And then there's full-day formats in both Houston and Midland. So you have a choice between April, July, or November to attend this class on refract candidate selection, execution, and performance evaluation. We've talked a little bit about Bob's experience. Here are some additional courses that Bob teaches for SCA, evaluating well performance for unconventional and conventional reservoirs, offered in Houston in July, practical interpretation of open hole logs, that's offered in Midland in April, Houston in both May and August, predicting organic shale well performance, that's offered in September in Midland. And finally, the refract sub selection class that we've already discussed. And I want to make note of some of the other free webinars that are on our calendar coming up. If you haven't signed up for these, uh, look on our website to get more information. Uh, we have Peter Slobby and Tom Maroney 
talking about designing and optimizing ENP asset performance. That's next week, Tuesday, March 2nd. We have the energy transition, the next step to net zero with Dr. Nathan Meehan. That's Tuesday, March 16th. And then the big, 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 big Ben field trip, normal faulting at Santa Elena Canyon is presented by Eric Carlson. That's April 8th. So put those on your calendar and plan to attend. And again, here's just one more slide that talks a little bit about the class that relates to this webinar. So Bob, I'm going to provide the presentation rights to you and let you get started. Okay, thank you, Susan. You're welcome. Appreciate that. Okay. Good afternoon or good morning if you're from Denver or West Parts West. I'm Bob Barbe and I'd like to share the results of a study that was commissioned and sponsored by my friends at Adventure. And the topic is uh, identifying economic refract candidates, specific economic refract candidates in Eagleford and Southern Midland Basin. You know, we've identified specific wells that are refract candidates, unlike some of the studies that just give you methodologies. Uh, we've got some specific wells to work with, okay? Um, what do refracts and my favorite comedian have in common? Uh, we, other than just, they both get no respect, as everybody knows, I'm sure. But the, Kind of a little aside, the little gravestone on the right is kind of a neat little deal. Uh, if you ever get to Los Angeles, it's in a neat little cemetery with a lot of other celebrities are buried. It's just off of Wilshire Boulevard, uh, east of uh, Interstate 405, or or if you're from California or from the People's Republic of California, you know, the, the D45 or D405. That's the two ways you can tell if someone's from California, if they're in Texas, you know, number one's by the way they drive, and don't need to elaborate on that, I don't think, but the other is if they start calling it the D610 when they're in Houston, then you know they're they're Californian. So it's a dead giveaway. Don't understand why they're the only people to do that, but that's neither here nor there, I guess. Okay. But basically, we're looking at okay. The last two down cycles, you know, 2009 and 2015, you know, there was a pretty big increase in refract papers and conferences. Uh, in fact, I used to make jokes back then that I'd been involved in more refract conferences than I've been involved in major refract projects, and that was a true statement. <laughs> and unfortunately, the majority of them up to 2015, at least in the organic shale world, uh, recommended diverters, you know, using like polylactic acid or you know, ball sealers or, uh, you know, the cat toys, the like. Uh, the reference one, there's SPE number down there, was a major paper done by Protechnics, and their key finding in 2015 is that, yeah, you use diverters, you can't divert more than 2,000 feet. Now, I think we've found out subsequent to that, you really can't divert more than one foot, but that's you know, neither here nor there. But, uh, the, uh, you know, when we look at the mechanics of trying to divert, I uh, looked at 58 wells uh, completed prior to 2015 in the university lands in West Texas. And there was an average of 1,136 open perforations that you're pumping into when you start these jobs. Now, they get fewer and fewer as you drop more and more diverter, but the mechanics of doing that versus the mechanics of putting a cemented uh, or expandable liner or cemented liner, uh, more expensive than cemented liner in place, uh, are you know, completely different. I mean, you're basically starting with a new well bore when you, when you mechanically isolate, and you're really uh, pumping and praying a lot when you do the other methodology. But uh, and the results were poor, you know, and they, you know, the refracts getting little respect, just like Rodney, uh, was very well justified. You know, it's not, and the results were not good. I mean, they were cheap. You know, you could probably get the, a refract done for, you know, a couple hundred grand, maybe, maybe half a million at the most, but uh, versus, you know, three and a half million is what we're using on our AFE estimates. But the results were horrible. I mean, they were, they were just, you just, you just, you're, the mechanics of trying to do over a thousand perforations and then get effective fracks are just just not there. So, but uh, you know, so good news is from 2017 on, you know, I guess enough of these disasters have taken place when people finally realize that wait a minute, this isn't working. Uh, let's try mechanical isolation methods uh, first with uh, cemented casing, and then uh, second uh, with expandable liners, which make more sense. I think we'll show you that. But uh, mechanical isolation is definitely a lot better. Uh, but the problem with that is now now we're looking at uh, basically the history of refracts with the very poor results. And uh, unfortunately, the engineers that saw these disasters on location are now the asset managers and above, and they're the ones who write the checks. One of my clients in West Texas, I was talking to her a while back and said, you know, where, where are we at on refracts on these parent wells or primary wells? 
And she told me, says, you know, Bob, you got to come up with a different term. You know, if, if I tell my boss I'm going to do a refract, you know, I'm, I'm persona non grata in the office. So I've got to use another term for that, like a workover or something like that. So it's they've definitely got a stigma and the stigma is well deserved. But the thing is, it's a whole new ball game now. Now that people are, have accepted that mechanical isolation is really the only way to do a refract, uh, the results are going to be a lot more consistent. But, you know, they're still having difficulty getting traction and you know, now even more difficult because of the pricing scenarios. Hopefully we'll show you, though, that the refracts are definitely competitive on an economic basis uh, with new wells, if not better. And they require less capital, which is, you know, nobody wants to spend any more money than they have to now, but they still want to maintain their production rates. Uh, you know, and I, I saw a presentation by one uh, operator at one of the conferences that said, they're going to they need to drill 11.3 wells to get their production rates uh, to stabilize. You know? <laughs> so they figured out what they have to do to keep them stable. Uh, we submit that it's a lot more you know, efficient to use refracts than it is to try to use new wells as well. OK. Uh, the study basically looked at uh, 327. Let me get my thing out of the way here so I can see. 327 producing wells and 159 open hole well logs in the South Texas Eagleford, mostly in the condensate window, and in the Southern Midland Basin, you know, basically, the, you know, Reagan, Upton, area, and Crockett counties uh, in organic shale and the Wolf Camp. So, get this here. keep going here. Okay. Again, we ran the economics with a bunch of different strips, you know, starting a couple months ago when we got the paper pretty much put together, and uh, we've got now results with February 15th strip which is a little bit high then of course that's a near month there at 56 it drops down to or near year it drops down in the 40s fairly quickly uh, but even if you run the december 2020 strip which is ten dollars lower than the current strip or those the, the strips higher now I, I haven't run it with a new scenario but the economics are strong and only a few of them fall off below the 25 percent cutoff that i used for internal rate of return at the lower price so it is relatively insensitive to price assuming you don't get much lower than 46 or so which hopefully Hopefully we don't, but uh, at any rate, so it's strong economics and, it, and it's not necessarily price sensitive. You know, you don't necessarily have to have astronomically high product prices to make them work. And the, the production estimates and costs assume best practices, which are extreme limited entry, which we'll call XLE, uh, close cluster spacing, which, you know, 15 feet or so, plus or minus, and expandable liners uh, for the highest cluster efficiency at the lowest cost. If you start uh, doing other types of diversion or don't use XLE and you use cemented liners, the, the costs are going to be a lot higher with the cemented versus expandable. And then your uh, cluster efficiency is going to be a lot lower with the other one. So all bets are off. I mean, none of this stuff will work if you don't use best practices. And best practices means you have to maximize the stimulated reservoir volume with the refract at the minimum possible cost. You know, you, you, you know, I've seen a lot of wells that are recently completed in the, in the shales and they're not using best practices. A lot of operators are still not using XLE. A lot of operators are still spreading their clusters out. So it's, uh, you know, the assumption that we look at is, you know, we, we can't just hand you the candidate and let you go back and do it the way you've always done it if you're not doing these practices, because that, that's not, you know, not gonna work. Uh, we found 72 wells in the Eagleford and 43 wells in the Midland Basin. And I used the cutoff of an internal rate of return over 25%. And there's a lot more uh, in the in the areas, but those those are the ones that I put together and ran the statistics on. So it's, this is just a subsample of these. Uh, so the internal rate of return was over 100% uh, P50 on the Eagleford and over you know 3.74 million uh, NPV10. That's a present value minus the three and a half million dollar estimated refract cost. In the Midland Basin, with a little bit different decline profile, a little more oil, uh, a little more oily. Again, we're in the condensate window for the Eagleford. Two different decline uh, type uh, scenarios, but the uh, rate of return is still pretty strong, 54%, P50, and 4.7 NPV10. So all in all, pretty pretty competitive. So, you know, and also the good news is that you're at two-thirds the cost of a new well. Now, you know, your, your rate of return is going to be better now your NPV might be a little lower but then again you got to spend more you got to you got to spend more for the cost to get a new well you know we're looking at about two-thirds of the cost of a new well for a refract plus or minus and the main thing of refracts right now and when you know we're looking at uh, everybody's cutting their spending everybody's got slim capital budgets now trying to weather the storm and uh we think refracts present a unique opportunity to maintain your production levels during this period you know at a lower cost than what you're looking at for uh a new well. 
which is the main competition for the capital for these. Uh, we've done two recent studies. Uh, we started in the Eagleford. Uh, InVenture got me started on that uh, down south a while back. Uh, we went through the Eagleford. And then we, we had some work we had done originally, initially for our uh, uh, your tech paper last year with InVenture as well. Uh, that uh, we studied the Midland Basin. We went back and revisited that using the models that we developed for that. So we were able to expand it to both areas. Okay. Uh, both areas have a large number of wide cluster spacing wells. And that's the big thing right now is cluster spacing. We'll show you how that ties in. And that's really the key parameter that you need to look at. Uh, you know, we've, the wide cluster spacing wells have got, you know, largely, you know, very limited SRVs large volumes of stranded hydrocarbons. And if you look at the 40 foot cutoff or so, which we're using, 40 foot physical cutoff, which we'll show you can actually be more of a 60 or 80 foot, depending on your cluster efficiency. Uh, we assuming using 40 feet, there's over 9,000 wells in both areas that have that spacing. So now not all are refract candidates. They may not have the mechanical properties in West Texas. You may have limited uh, height from your uh, barriers there. Uh, Eagleford, it, you don't really have any issues with mechanical properties uh, so much of you know, your boot is really the only thing that drives the height there, but uh, downward height. But uh, there it's OIP or gas in place. You know, if you, you know, just because a, a well has a low recovery factor doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a refract candidate. It's got to have enough oil and gas on the ground to make it work. And that's a function of how in the West Texas, the primary thing that drives that is where the barriers are, where your carbon stringers come in. But uh, you know, your first lateral in Eagleford was 2008, uh, over 100 foot cluster spacing, uh, Southern Midland Basin 2009. So, you know, that over 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, almost 12 years ago, some of these. So, you know, you've got a lot of history there. Unlike a lot of the other areas like the Northern Midland Basin and some areas like that have fairly close cluster spacing right now, you don't have that many refract candidates. I mean, you wanna look at refracting uh, you know, the, the uh, primary or parent wells always, you know, that's always the option you want to look at there. But for production, uh, not so much. You're going to have a hard time improving production if you're already on 15 or 20 foot cluster spacing on a new well. But uh, on the other hand, in the southern Midland Basin, you know, again, the first wells there were over 100 feet cluster spacing and it came down. And we'll show you the specifics on that as we go. Uh, Eagleford in 2011, the average was 72 feet. Some of the initial core lab wells were 110, 120 foot cluster spacing. And now we're on 15 down there, 13 to 15. Uh, Southern Midland Basin, the average of all the university lands was 116 feet again, so which is quite a bit. So you know, we got a lot of improvement there if you're looking at you know 15 feet being now the recommended uh, spacing. Again, which is what we said here, okay. This came from a study that was done on university lands, uh, over by uh, the university lands group. There's a reference down there in the lower right-hand corner. Let's see if I get my, I don't know why my pointer's not working there. There we go, yeah, there we go, okay. <clears throat> and this is interesting. This was done with a dual porosity model. Uh, they integrated RTA, they integrated all the uh, production data, they had individual well production data, they had all kinds of, did basically, you know, geological mapping of all the parameters and you got everything put together. It was a fairly integrated study. And what they came up with was a relationship between cluster spacing and your recovery factors. Now, there's certainly an influence of your profit volume and your concentration, profit loading and fluid loading. But by and large, that's increased along with the cluster spacing decrease. So it's kind of hard to split those out. But Assuming that you don't pump, you know, 500 or 1,000 pounds per foot of a profit, you know, and everybody's in the 2,000 and above now, pretty much your cluster spacing is what's going to drive your recovery factor. And that gives you a lot of flexibility when you're trying to work with the data. If you don't have three variables to put in there to try and determine what drives this, uh, it makes it a lot simpler. Uh, we did a 179 well study in Urtec 2662 with, uh, with InVenture back in uh, at last Urtec. And we came up with a 13.7% P50 recovery factor. Uh, and again, we had 39 wells with cluster spacing less than 20 feet with clear producing heights. There were probably over 100 wells that had small cluster spacings, but we didn't have real clear producing heights. And that's something we're going to address coming up here. If you can't estimate the H from the uh, mechanical properties, you know, if you don't have a 3D model or if you don't have good inputs for the 3D model, it's hard to do this from an analytical point of view to try and figure out what your H is because the conventional method involves estimating OIP or gas in place and working from there. But if you don't know what the height is, it's very difficult to do that. 
Uh, the key data point, though, is we had a 10 well sample, that little red dot over here, the second red dot, uh, uh, where we took an average of wells that had an average of 56 foot cluster spacing. Look where that dot falls. Pretty convincing uh, that you're that you're in that range. Uh, so these were these were we had good height data, we had good petrophysical data, we were able to get the recovery factors from that, and that's where they plotted right on that curve. So it gives you confidence that you can use this as a as kind of a proxy for your recovery factor. If you know your cluster spacing, you can get a basically you can get a you know a minimum number for your estimated reserves. And we'll talk about that coming up because that's an important tool to use later on. And, uh, but uh, here's a picture from the Eagleford of a uh, uh, little uh, pilot that was done a while back where they drilled a monitor well 70 feet away. This is from Conoco. And uh, it was the original data, original work they did on that big uh, laboratory they had down there in, in the, in the in Eagleford. 50-foot uh, cluster spacing on the offset well. And basically what they were showing when they did the pressure monitor 70 feet away, uh, that you only had about seven and a half foot of lateral drainage. Uh, in the monitor well. So 85% of the rock is producing almost zero with 50 foot cluster spacing. Uh, it's 50 foot cluster spacing or 40 foot or 30 foot going to drain the maximum SRV. No, you've got to get down in this range. I mean, and the operator actually attempted to try and go down to seven feet, I believe that they were saying, but uh, you start getting into cluster or stress shadowing issues when you get too close. So that's where 13 to 15 is probably the minimum that most people are using right now. And that's what we recommend. We'll probably do a little bit more in the Permian based on the next slide that we're looking at, going to see. But, uh, you know, 15 foot or so is a good, nice, close cluster spacing. And what we're seeing with the 15 foot plus or minus clusters is that you're getting recovery factors that are getting really close to what you have in conventional solution gas drive reservoirs, type reservoirs. You know, 15 percent number is pretty well established. I mean, that's that's something you're not going to get much argument from from people. That's that's a number that's been established worldwide in all reservoirs for primary recovery with solution gas drive. And uh, so as you get more and more of your SRV, you know, and you're probably never going to get to 100%. I think to get to expect 100% stimulation, you know, of all your reservoir volume is unrealistic because you are going to deal with stress shattering where you're starting to compete with these. Uh, you get these first two close together, they fight each other pretty hard. Uh, when you, you know, the closer you get them, the more they try to, you know, more anisotropy they create, they create, you know, a different uh, sig x min, you know, you get more max min stress orientations when you have them closer together, but there is a point of diminishing returns where you get them too close together. So that's why we typically think 13 to 15 feet is what you want to be looking at in your spacing. Uh, here's your Eagleford cluster spacing versus completion date. You can see that prior to 2015, you had a real high probability of, of uh, clusters you can be in uh, more than 40 feet. Uh, you can really almost go out to 2017 there. We looked at just 2015 for that 9,000 number, but if you extend that farther to the right and consider that some of those 40 foot cluster spacings there in this region, if they have low cluster efficiencies, that you're uh, basically looking at, you know, quite a bit larger than that effective spacing. You know, if you have 50% cluster efficiency and 40 foot cluster spacing, you've got 100 foot effective spacing. So you're draining that reservoir 100 feet apart effectively, which is way, way inefficient. You're looking at a two or three percent recovery factor. But uh, and when the, for the model calibration, we looked at out here. We looked at the wells that had small cluster spacing. We looked at what the recovery factors were here and used that as our benchmark for what the refract should be producing. So that was the key there. Here's an uh, example from the Wolf Camp. This was from uh, the GTI uh, Reagan study. And basically, you're showing from the propped width here, at least what's what's width is about, you know, 15, 19, 20 feet. But basically, that means 60% of the stage was not stimulated with 50 foot spacing. Uh, the predicted recovery factor using that uh, plot back a few slides using this guy. Let me go back to him. Well, sorry, you remember what it was. It's hard to go back. Yeah, this guy. Yeah, using this guy. Uh, your predicted recovery factor from that relationship was around 6%. And uh, they did a big detailed reservoir study in ERTEC 2434 and showed that about 7.4% recovery factor is what they saw. So we're in the ballpark. You know, it's not going to be something you're going to calculate to the third decimal place. You've got a lot of other variables. You're making assumptions on drainage width and things like that. But uh, basically, this is showing that, you know, unless you get your clusters closer together, you're not stimulating all your reservoir. And it's predictably you know, a, a function of your cluster spacing. 
here's the same plot for the university lands uh basically prior to 2015 or actually half the second half of 2015 really the first half people were still using stuff but i'm using long spacing in most areas there are a few few outliers in here where people actually went to closer cluster spacings but not enough to get everybody doing the same thing i think finally everybody got the memo here once the prices cratered in 2014 people had time to regroup and actually take a breath and think started looking back and say wait a minute you know we start moving these clusters closer together we're getting better results for the same oip uh, let's do that and the industry kind of moved forward on that so what are the primary challenges okay well basically you want to control your fracture entry points to stimulate as close to 100 percent of the new rock again you're not going to get 100 percent, but closer and closer you get the clusters together the closer and closer you get to 100 percent uh as a, opposed to the traditional refract methods in 2009 or 2015 where you're putting diverter you're really not controlling fracture entry points with diverter it's a it's a grab bag you're really rolling the dice with diverter so the cemented liners and expandable liners will control the fracture entry points because you're basically doing a new completion with that a brand new plug and perf and you want to execute a premium optimized frac at the lowest cost per barrel using best practices uh, you want to use the most efficient method possible to do that keep your cost down because cost is always a consideration particularly when the prices are low and with that for that we recommend extreme limited entry and expandable liners and we presented a couple papers on that already one at the annual meeting last year before last in calgary and also the your tech paper talked about it a little bit uh, with larger ids on the expandables you can get longer stage lengths which means less cost per uh less you know basically much lower cost uh, initial costs a little bit higher, but you get more than that back by a factor of four or five, depending on how you know, how much uh, how long your lateral was. Uh, the three and a half million dollar AFB, we got pushed back on that a couple times, and we said, "Well, what are you doing?" Said, well, we're doing conventional perforating, and we're trying to cement a liner. Well, yeah, of course you're not going to get it for 3.5 million. <laughs> you got to do you got to follow the the prescription here to make it work. I mean, you can't just go out and complete it the way you want to complete it. And assume it's going to work out but all these projections are based on getting really high cluster efficiency 90 percent or above and keeping the cost down not doing any more stages than you have to so and basically you're you're looking at uh, once you get your liner installed uh you're basically it looks like a new well you just do a conventional plug and perp there's absolutely no difference between that and a, and a conventional frack uh you want to use extreme limited entry and that's you know we've got some really good examples that came out in the last year on that uh you know you, you know basically you're looking at very high cluster efficiencies 85 to 90 percent even with the longer stages and sm did a really neat little paper in howard county at the or at the frac conference that uh showed that on the next slide and uh we're goes without saying we're assuming high cluster efficiencies for all the economic analysis scenarios we're assuming you're going to get the rock stimulated and that's not going to be an issue you know whereas if you go in there with phase perforating or you know and don't use xle and try diverter or these engineered completions uh, all bets are off here's the sm study that was done in howard county basically they they went they used xle uh, 2000 to 3000 psi pressure drop 3000 is probably recommended more than 2000 uh, equal entry hole size and they saw no degradation in the number of active clusters when they expanded their stage length by 25 percent which makes sense. This is what you would, you know, the physics dictates this is what's going to happen, but this actually proves that you are able to do that, that XLE actually works. Uh, more dramatic was the work that Devin did, uh, Kyle Heisweit's uh, work up there, and there's the SPE paper on that, where they looked at the uh, volume to first response in the, uh, in the pressure monitor well, offsetting it. If you have a very quick response on your pressure, that means you've got something like you have here on the right, where you don't have even diversion where basically you've got some that hit right away. And then if you've got a very high volume to first response, which they do in every case in the XLE uh, scenario, it's it's different. So XLE is kind of magical. It gives you a lot short. And then also you're going to see a lot more frack hits in your offset wells with this type of scenario here. You've got it's controlled. You're choking back the flow pretty effectively with XLE. And the next slide came from Kyle's paper as well, uh, basically showing 2,500 to 2,750 pounds. You had the highest volume to first response. And yet a low response, your low numbers here, you've got a very, very low uh, efficiency. So your high delta P is gonna delay that response quite a bit. So that's very important because you have to have high cluster efficiency in, in there and you wanna make sure you, you know, basically uh, get, get it put away. And also you wanna try and minimize your growth into the other wells around you, which the XLE does that. 
perforating efficiency, cluster efficiency. Here's a study that was done up in, uh, by Liberty in the Bakken. Now, there's a reference down in the lower right-hand corner and showed that you're looking at about 85% or so, uh, 85 to 90% cluster efficiency. And most of the studies that have come out since then with fiber optics, like the SM study, were showing pretty much the same thing. Uh, that's the numbers you can expect. If you don't use that, the average is about 59%. So, you know, that's that's important because if you're trying to do projections based on cluster spacing versus recovery factor, you need to know this. I mean, because if you assume it's 40 foot cluster spacing and that's what you're basing your economics on, you might actually have 80 foot cluster spacing if you've only got 50 foot, 50 uh, percent cluster efficiency. So high cluster efficiency is important. That's why I say XLE is not recommended. It's required. You really don't have a choice if you want to get this to work. OK. And this is what I just talked about. You know, if you assume a 40-foot physical spacing, uh, the, uh, the paper from uh, Liberty showed, you know, the basically with no diversion results, you average around 59. There's kind of a range on that. You, know, you saw it in there. But it's only really 40 feet if you have 100% cluster uh, efficiency, which you typically don't unless you do something like XLE. And uh, this is important because it's basically what this allows you to do is a minimum. So if you know, if you assume it's this, it's actually this, that's a lot more oil and the gas in the ground to come out. But if you make your assumptions based on this number, if you base your assumption based on 40 foot physical spacing and call that your actual spacing, you're going to be very pessimistic on your results. So you're definitely going to, you know, basically under promise and over deliver in that case, which is where you want to do. You don't want to promise more than what you can deliver. The overall process, uh, primary well or parent well, uh, you know, if, if it's a primary or parent well, it's always a refract candidate regardless whether it's economic or not. Uh, you know, you're looking at a pretty big hit to your infill wells if you don't. Uh, basically, if it's not, then you do a recovery factor analysis. You come down here and say, okay, is there enough oil in place there? Uh, what's your current recovery factor? Through a couple of different techniques. One is actually physically measuring the oil in place and physically subtracting out the uh, subtracting out the estimated ultimate recovery from the, refer from the well, the current EUR. Uh, and the other is using the recovery factor to back in the recovery factor. And we'll talk about that coming up. You know, back out your OIP from the uh, recovery factor. If you don't really have an eye handle on what your height is, which some of these wolf camp walls with really thin barriers, it's really hard to predict what the height is ahead of time. Whereas it's using the recovery factor backwards, you just, the only assumption you're making is that you have the same producing height that you do on the original deal. But if you do decide it's good to, eat, to refract, then basically you look at your options, expandables, cemented, diverters, uh, expandables are recommended, of course. Uh, and then you implement the refract. 13.3 is probably the lowest. Typically, that's just in there. Put three clusters per pipe joint uh, or 15 feet plus or minus in there. And then uh, whatever gen you're calling it now, gen four, gen five, gen whatever, <laughs> XLE and plug and perf and then the offset wells. In fact, normally what people will do on a pad is just, just roll the roll the refract into the zipper. So you do them all at once, so at any rate. But that's the refract optimization uh, flow. Uh, what you typically do though to actually implement that, you estimate the drainage height using a P3D hydraulic fracture model. That's primarily for the Wolf Camp. Uh, I haven't seen, I've seen a couple cases in McMullen where you might need to do that with the Eagleford, but most of the time you've got a fairly stress-free uh, rock above the Buddha there. So where whatever your height's gonna be is you know, controlled by the volume there. Um, estimate your oil and gas in place from the drainage height and then do your petrophysical property mapping because you're typically not looking at the well, you're actually fracking with the log analysis. You've got to interpolate between data points. Uh, look at your expected recovery factor using XLE, Close cluster spacing, high propellant loading, and high fluid loading, which we've done with those calibration wells with short cluster spacing. That's the 13.7% for the oil uh, oil reservoirs. Uh, the gas condensate, uh, we're 35% is what we came up with, and that's of the gas in place. All you can really measure on the uh, gas condensate wells is your gas in place, and then you've got to back out the uh, recoveries using the yields from there, or your condensate yields. Uh, calculate the remaining mobile hydrocarbons between the expected recovery and current cum recovery, or really use EUR to be more, be more conservative. And then allocate the volumes on a monthly basis, looking at the type curve decline rates. You know, if it declines at 1% a month, then you decline in the initial potential that you throw in there as a, to iterate on until you match your, your expected recovery. So it gives you a month-to-month -month, uh, distribution. 
And then once you've got a month to month distribution and you've got a well cost, then you can estimate your net present value and internal rate of return for the refrac. So that's fairly straightforward. This is conventional analysis. Uh, again, we're gonna do a shortcut on that in the Midland Basin, looking at the recovery factors and trying to back out the OIP uh, for you know, the reasons we talked about earlier. But this is the conventional method for doing it. If you have good petrophysical data, if you have good height estimation and, uh, and the like. And then, of course, best practices again. I'm going to get tired of me telling you this, but you know, go ahead and make sure you do best practices. Don't don't take any shortcuts at this point after you've done all this work. Okay, that's the theory of overall um, refract candidate evaluation. Now let's look at some specifics uh, in the Eagleford condensate window. This is the well logs we looked at, 124 total wells. We basically dumped the entire South Texas database for TGS and went through there and looked at where the wells were and then looked at producers around there and used that. So these are the open hole logs in the condensate window. Now, why do we focus on the condensate window, you might ask, other than the fact it's got a lot of good economic candidates. But uh, one thing is they have individual well production. Uh, you don't need to go to the operators. You know, we, we went to the individual operators in the Midland Basin in the uh, liquids rich area. Uh, South Texas, we've got, you know, 40 some operators we're dealing with to get individual production would just be a, real hassle <laughs> so uh and as everybody everybody's familiar with the allocated production routines in fact i had to redo my entire wolf camp analysis last week because i went ahead and used allocated production for the estimates and then decided to pull another alternate source of allocated production and it was like an order of magnitude difference in some cases so i had to go back and use data that i knew that the EURs on <laughs> to do that so using allocated production from the, the vendors is not recommended. It's a, it's, it's a shotgun and you're gonna get really bad data typically. But uh, at any rate, you don't need it if it's gas well or gas condensate well, so you don't have to go through that hoop. Uh, again, it's a little more complicated and we'll talk about that in the class, how you do this. I don't have time today to go into it, but basically you're looking at MCF equivalent in the ground and then you've got to apply a yield profile to work with that. And that's where the 35% number came out as in that. Uh, the big thing in condensate window is the yields, though. It's scary how variable they are. Uh, in new wells, if you plot the yields, there's a large difference in yields over very short distances. So it's kind of scary drilling a new well. The risk, the risk on a new well is, unless it's on the same pad, perhaps, uh, you know, of getting the yield that's predictable is 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 high. Uh, again, if you do a refract, though, you've got an established condensate yield. It's unlikely that the condensate yield is going to change that much between the original frac and the refract. So, you know, you ought to have a much higher risk rate, adjusted rate of return for new wells because you've got that yield variable. And then basically you can I'd say this earlier, this was comment from earlier, we are seeing a few more wells in the gas leg now. You know, EOG is doing some more uh, gas development, a couple other operators are doing some gas development now where a couple months ago they weren't. And, uh, but uh, most of the rigs are up dip of the gas condensate window. You don't, don't see too many in the window and that's just probably part of it because the new wells, you know, you've got that yield risk. And then even with uh, currently depressed price strips, the refract economics are excellent. They're really good in this window. Here's an example from LaSalle County. You can see that some, uh, you've got 100, almost 150 you know, barrels per million up here and not too far away, 90, 60, 22. I mean, I don't know if this is structurally related, 83, 18, 22, 46. You know, basically, What's your yield going to be if you put a well right in here? I mean, you know, I'm, it's hard to say. Now, if you're going to refract this well, though, it's probably going to be pretty close to that. You know, it should be. Here's a distribution of yields across Carnes and DeWitt, which are two of the main areas we studied. Um, you know, quite a bit, all the way from zero to 400. Take your pick, and it's fairly evenly distributed through there. So, in a lot of these range, you could have this guy and this guy in the same field from what we just saw. So, knowing the yield ahead of time is a big plus. And that's the other benefit of doing the uh, reef the condensate window. <clears throat> Again, well control is really important in the Eagleford. Uh, you get a lot of heterogeneity in the uh, OIP gas in place, and so the, the we had we had to, we were limited in the number of candidates we could look at because you had to have either open hole log coverage really close or surrounding it where you could map it, uh, and that wasn't always the case. And we only used publicly released data, so if we do an individual project for an operator down there. Going forward, if they have additional open hole log data uh, and individual well production data, we can do that oil window and the gas window for sure. But the, any, the oil window, we can do the same workflow 
<clears throat> it was just the condensate window had a better data, but uh, the same data applies and we can use additional log data points. So we're not limited to what we have in the study as far as the analysis there. And there are a lot of open hole logs available in the liquids window as well. But uh, we looked at all the available open hole logs uh, for the six counties within the window listed there. Uh, 124 total logs, we identified them, digitized and analyzed them for gas in place. And then basically we posted these to each operator's wells to determine if the log control was available for each of the candidates. So we were seeing where the producing wells were relative to the open hole control points. And we didn't stray very far, you know, it's, it's kind of scary how quick this stuff changes down there. But uh, we only use producers close to the open hole log wells or in between control points. That eliminated a lot of candidates that looked like they're pretty good candidates to start with, but we didn't have 100% confidence in our open hole data. So. Okay, here's the economics from the condensate windows, some candidates or so. Uh, your P50, 110%. P10 is off the charts. And in the P90, which is your worst case scenario, you're still making money. So, I mean, in that P90, when you go down to, um, you know, the, the other price strip, this is your price strip down here uh, from February 15th. Again, it's in the 40s before too long. You know, it's in the high 40s all the way out, even with a $56 initial price. Your uh, price back in December was in the 40s, like $46 or so in the near year. But then, then it stayed pretty constant. So your, your P1090 there, I think it was in the 35 or 37 percent range. So. Worst case scenario, you know, hopefully that's the worst case scenario pricing wise, but worst case scenario, you're still, uh, you're still looking pretty good here. So anyway, there's your distribution of the different wells there. Here's the operators. Uh, we don't have the wells listed, but we got the operators, uh, the condensate window candidates listed there, but the number of an uh, candidates that are on there, you all know who those people are. If you're one of these people, you know who you are. But, uh, these are the companies that we've identified specific uh, wells with refract potential with rates of return over 25 percent. Uh, to summarize the Eagleford part, uh, basically we presented a methodology to get your remaining mobile gas condensate and gas in each refract candidate in the window. And again, we have an advantage in condensate well analysis because you know we know the yield ahead of time. We remove the yield risk with a refract. We know what it's going to be. Again, we identified 72 viable candidates with the complete analysis. Uh, the required best practice again, just to repeat, you know, expandables, uh, close cluster spacing, and XLE again, just to kind of hammer that home. Mainly because we've been talking about this for a while, and then looking at current completions across all those basins, people aren't still aren't doing it. I mean, the close cluster spacing, yeah, but the expandables and then the close the uh, expandables and then the XLE, uh, not so much. So. Uh, that I think is something that everybody needs to consider because we it definitely reduces a lot of the uncertainty in how these things are going to come out. Okay, then we'll take questions at the end on that. But uh, let's look at part two for the Southern Midland Basin. You know why focus on the Southern Midland Basin? I, it was the first. It was the first area in the Permian Basin to employ uh, horizontal multi-stage frac techniques. Uh, first lateral was done by Broad Oak, which was later Laredo. In August 2009, uh, I believe it was 111 foot cluster spacing. I couldn't get the exact number of clusters, but I'm assuming that since everybody else had the same number of clusters back then, that that's about it. It could be a little less than that, but at any rate. But then again, the average from of all the wells there in 2011 was still over 100 feet. So that's not un un unreasonable to expect that. And now we're on 15 to 20. So a lot of, uh, a lot of potential there with these initial cluster spacings. Again, 56 feet. It was the average before 2015, and the average in 2011 was actually over 100 feet. Uh, again, this, the uh, studies, those two studies we talked about, the study that was done by University Lands, uh, and also the study that we did on EarthTech last year, uh, show that basically you, your recovery factors can be directly related to cluster spacing. You know, you, you, you've got a multivariate solution in there with profit loading and fluid loading and cluster spacing with the three biggies, but uh, by and large, uh, cluster spacing alone is really what you can look at using based on our study results agreeing with the uh, university lands simulations. Uh, and again, it's a large number of university lands wells in Southern Midland Basin where operators are required to release data. Operators are real stingy about releasing data on cluster spacing. Everybody's first to tell you right away how much, how much profit loading they're doing, how they're doing the latest generation fracks, but they never include in any of the public data what their cluster spacing is. So uh, 
that's something that's very important. It's probably the most important number, and that's something that's not available typically. Although there's a pretty large number of wells in university lands where they do have that data, and we use that. Uh, again, it's not typically released to operators that don't have leases on, on lands. Uh, we, we documented the recovery factor process uh, again in our ERTEC paper, 13.7%, you know, which is just under 15%. And again, you're not going to get to 15 probably because you have to put the close, clusters too close together. To, and shadowing is going to bite you. But uh, 196 producing wells, 36 open hole well logs. We're used in that. Uh, individual well production we got from the operators, so we didn't have to allocate. Uh, and we did a comparison of allocated versus the uh, operator production, and it was a complete shotgun. The allocated production for this is pretty much useless. Any, anything you get on individual well production in liquid rich areas from the, you know, any, any of the vendors. I looked at all three vendors that provide the data we use, and none of them were an agreement with each other, and the agreement with the actual data was very, very poor. 302 open hole logs have been analyzed total in those areas. We only use 36 to do the calibration, but we have the data available for all these uh, these wells down there in those four counties, which we're calling these are the these these are the Southern Midland Basin counties we're dealing with. And uh, we generated all in place and in situ stress profiles for all these wells. Uh, and then out of that batch, we found uh, 74 out of the batch of the uh, wells that are out there. We looked at uh, Prior to Q1 2015, with cluster spacing reported, we had 43 of the 74 wells with economic OIP. So again, this is just a subset of all the data down there, just a small subset. This is not to say that all that's all you have for refract candidates down there. There's a lot more than that. Okay, there's where we have data. Again, we didn't use all of these. We used the ones that were closer to the to the producers for the initial calibration. But after the initial calibration, we used the recovery factor method to come up with this, where we didn't have to have all the data. So uh, pretty much the logs, you, you need that to do the calibration of the model. But once you get the model going, you can look at using the recovery factor, at least for the first screening. And then you want to go back in and use the logs to do the, the analysis. We, we recommend the complete analysis on all these. <clears throat> However, for screening purposes, uh, we'll talk about a quick look to try and come up with the OIP using the recovery factor coming up here next. So you know, we talk about in pretty much quick and detail in the ERTEC paper, you know, how to get the producing age with a 3D model, how to, you know, look at the OIP. Basically, we go through all that, so I won't repeat that here. But uh, the problem is we ran into, you know, we had 39 candidates that had close cluster spacing and clear layers. There were probably, I mean, easily twice that many wells that had close cluster spacing, but we couldn't get a real good handle on what the, the height was, because if you got thin barriers, which you may not even be seeing the barriers with a log resolution. Your log resolution is a lot thicker than what we're seeing on the FMI logs. You were seeing six inch, 12 inch uh, layers that are in these rocks on the on the images, and you're not seeing that on the uh, frosty logs. So you may not be characterizing all of your uh, barriers very well. But uh, so basically that's an issue that we're gonna talk about with recovery factor analysis. So what we propose is a quick look OIP estimation process to avoid the limitations of that. So we were only able to identify, use about half the wells down there for analysis based on the open old log data availability and also on the, you know, the, the basic height limitation. If you're not really sure about the height, if there's three or four different options for height, uh, it's kind of hard to do that, kind of hard to get a unique answer. So there's a way to come to back into that, though, with your recovery factor. And then... Basically, it's a maximum value since your modeling that was done by University Lands uh, assumed 100% cluster efficiency. It was all basically done <laughs> with a dual porosity model and reservoir simulator to come up with that. So, you know, it's it's going to be a maximum value, but that's okay you know, because that's going to basically under under promise and over deliver as the model in the work that we do. So, I mean, that clearly gives you a, a pessimistic or conservative estimate of what's remaining. You know, if you had better cluster efficiency than what you thought, I mean, if you had the same numbers, you're going to be right. But if you had more of a, uh, you know, say you had a 40 foot cluster spacing and 50 percent cluster efficiency that, you you know, you're off, but you're off in a good direction. If it still works with the numbers that you get, then it's definitely going to work with the actual number. So, again, you can take the OIP uh, est and estimate it by taking the EUR by the maximum recovery factor for that particular cluster spacing. So if you got 10%, you know, basically work work through the math backwards because you, your EURs, your, your OIP, your recoverables is a percentage of that OIP. And then basically you can look at, uh, once you get that, you can go back in and, and get your candidates. You can go in and do a, a detailed analysis. But 
The uh, other thing you can do too, is since your well cost is going to be relieving 3.5 million as a constant, uh, relieving the pricing is a constant, relieving the decline is a constant, you know, the decline rate is a constant for the area. Really, the only thing that's going to change your internal rate of return and at present value is the EUR from the refract. So you don't have to sit down and do detailed economics each time. You, you can develop an empirical relationship between the two, which is a good quick look. Here's an uh, example from the uh, Wolf Camp. Again, you, you, you plot your refract EUR, which is your OIP minus your cumulative production, or really EUR is what we like to use because cumulative gives you a little bit more, but EUR gives you a little more pessimistic number, again, under promise, over deliver, and then PV. And so basically, you can, if you know what your, your remaining hydrocarbons are, then you can run a quick number uh, analysis here, and that gives you a good screening technique. Same thing for rate of return, uh, same thing. So basically, it's a quick look uh, method. Again, it's you're keeping your wood refract cost constant, you're keeping your price strip constant, and using the same decline rate. The only thing that's going to change your numbers is the OIP, and, uh, that, that, that or remain recoverable oil. Here's your analysis for the Southern Midland Basin. Again, you see the P50 around 4.7, uh, your P10, you know, off the charts, even the P90s at 25% with 2 million. Uh, when you go to the lower price strip, you lose, I think about five to 10, I think it was about 5% of the wells fell off at that point. Uh, yeah, it was about 5% of the wells. So you did lose some, some drop below the 25 since that's your P90, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, it's, it's still not significantly price dependent. I mean, in the 45 to 55 dollar range, you know, lower than that, which we don't even want to think about. You know, it's none of this stuff works. But the uh, any rate, in the range we're expecting to see, or at least in the range the strips got out there, uh, we've got economic uh, candidates going in this area. Some of the operators that have pre uh, Q2 2015 completions, and I've seen a number of large cluster spacing wells since then. That's just your highest probability. You want to start with this cutoff. I mean, I would look at the uh, after uh, prior to Q2 2015, uh, I would look at those wells first, but there's a lot of wells. In fact, I've seen wells that are recent, uh, particularly those operators that are using the engineered completions where they've got still 40 foot average cluster spacings in 2020. Uh, now, some of the spacings, some of the clusters are close together. Some of them are spread out even more, but you know, it's uh, to make this work, we recommend equal cluster spacing and extreme limited entry to try and maximize your SRV. Now, you'll probably increase your cluster efficiency by going to the engineered completion by, you know, perforating like rock. But the problem is you're leaving a lot of oil on the ground. And we did a study in Eagleford with an operator that, that used the engineered completions and we were coming out around 12% recovery factor versus 13.7. So, I mean, not, that may not have been statistically significant, but that's about what you'd expect. You're gonna see a little lower recovery factor if you start spreading your clusters out although it may be offset by the cluster efficiency, but the best option is to have them tight together and use XLE. But overall, 28 operators, of course, again, some of these have been combined with other operators now, so that number's shrinking as we speak, even though other operators are buying other operators, but at any rate, the 28 total operators that were listed uh, with this. Uh, summarize, uh, we presented a methodology to evaluate the mobile oil and refract Canada economics in the Southern Midland Basin. Uh, also, in addition to the Eagle from before, 43 candidates we found based on the expected increases in recovery factor. Again, we didn't use the logs on this. We used the logs and the, uh, the actual oil in place to get the model to calibrate the 13.7%. That was in the Urtech paper, 2662. However, for the refract candidates, we used strictly cluster spacing. We just went ahead and said, okay, we know what the production is. We know what the EUR is on these wells. Uh, basically, use the EURs, not QMs. And we basically use that to come up with, you use the recovery factor based on where they were with cluster spacing to come up with that. And again, if we were pessimistic and, or you know, we were wrong in terms of, you know, your cluster efficiency is lower, then those numbers are going to get better. So you're, you're erring on the positive side. Again, the P50 was pretty strong, NPV10 pretty strong, IRR and uh, NPV. Again, uh, very competitive with new well results based on investor presentations. Uh, basically, if you can get a new well with this type of thing, you're doing pretty well. Uh, and that NPV is not too shabby. Now, you're going to probably get a higher NPV with a new well, but uh, at the same rate of return, maybe or lower. But, you know, it's your you're capital constraint now. Everybody's got tight budgets. Why would you want to spend 100% 100 of the cost on that, even if you're getting a little bit more oil out of the ground? Uh, particularly in the condensate window where you, you also reduce the risk of the uh, or in Eagleford condensate window where you reduce the risk of uh, 
yield being off. So it seems like an ideal storm right now for refrax. Uh, why we're not doing anymore, I'm still kind of scratching my head. But uh, at any rate, uh, you got lower cost up front, lower capital expenditure involved, and yet your returns are going to be competitive. Uh, again, best practices. Again, I keep I kind of keep, keep bringing this up, but I'm like I say, I'm kind of shocked that everybody's not doing this because it makes so much sense. And also, these are key assumptions that we made to give you these numbers. If you don't do these three things, basically, you're uh, looking at not getting the type of returns that we ask that we, we forecast. Bob, we have a question on the expandable liners. Sure. I think, it, yeah, just the course is the last thing. This is the last slide. And you've already showed this, Susan. So uh, and one thing I don't think you mentioned was the cost. We're looking at uh, uh, 720 for the cost coming up, uh, April 13th and 14th. And we cover this all in a lot more detail and get into the math and get into how we do all this in that class. Okay. You have a question, you said? Yeah. The question is, what expandable liner are you referring to with the $3.5 million cost? What expandable liner? The ones we have the best costs on are the adventure liner, of course, but uh, you know it's basically a, not a cemented liner. It's a expandable tubulars where you run the tubular in and then you expand it in situ. You get a much better ID and it allows you to go with higher rate. And basically rate, uh, a good rule of thumb for rate is if divide by six, unless you've got evidence that uh, you need more than six barrels a minute per cluster to get you a good frack, and that's where your 3D models come in. Uh, if, you're, if you run your 3D model and you get good height coverage with six barrels a minute per cluster, then basically you take your rate and divide it by six. So if you're going to be able to get 90 barrels a minute uh, with a uh, with a frack, then that's uh, that's 15 clusters. <laughs> and if you're only at 80, or say you're at you know, 78, you're only going to be able to get 13 clusters. So, uh, and that's that's going to make your stage, and if you keep your clusters 15 feet apart, basically by going with an expandable, you can typically add two to three clusters per stage, which is going to make a lot fewer stages and a lot lower cost overall. So that's the advantage of expandables is that you, you can get a lot cheaper completion because you can get more stage length. And the SM study pretty much showed that you can get away with that. I mean, we, it was all been theoretical until they came up with their study, but they increased their cluster, uh, their, their stage length by 25% and still got the same cluster efficiency, but they used XLE. So <clears throat> that's what we're talking about there. Great. And talk a little bit more about uh, using the cluster spacing, spacing as a proxy for recovery factors. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of the most controversial deal. In fact, we've got a separate paper we're working on on that, just on that right now. The um, coming up here it's our next paper we're going to try and present is on that because it's kind of an innovative deal and what it requires is to have faith in this I keep going here sorry about that when you're in the full screen mode it gets harder to go back and forth um, come on get up here this guy is kind of the key uh, and again the, the confidence in this is what you need to have uh, this was a theoretical modeling perspective that uh, the, the curves came off of, done by University Lands, Hongji Zhang, and the, and the group at University Lands did this. Um, but then again, we basically did two control points in our study using detailed data, uh, using uh, the full analysis, the, uh, the 3D model height prediction for, you know, and basically what we did was we modeled a single cluster. We assume we're using XLE and assume that you're getting six barrels a minute per cluster or whatever, you know, depending on how many clusters you have, model through that and see what you get for height and use that for your height on that and then use your oil in place within that uh, height. And then you compare that to EUR, you can get a good number. And that's what we came up with up here. This number here was from the closed cluster spacing wells, which is pretty close to their numbers, the ballpark. But then for the wide cluster spacing wells, we also did 10 wells here with all, and again, this was out of about 40 wells, we only picked wells that had really distinct heights that we were able to model with a 3D model. So, you know, there was a lot of candidates we couldn't look at because we didn't know what the height was. Well, the, the backside of that is if you believe this and use this cluster spacing as your minimum cluster spacing, again, you, if you have 50% cluster efficiency, this is actually 80, so you've got a much lower recovery here if you have that. If you've got 100% cluster efficiency, this number ought to be pretty good basically say, okay, at, at 40 feet cluster spacing, I'm looking at a 6% recovery factor. If I know my well had 40 foot cluster spacing, the maximum I'm going to get out of that is my EUR divided by 6% by 
So that's going to give you your uh, give you your you're going to back out your OIP because your your recoverable reserves that you're uh, looking at with recovery factor is your OIP times the recovery factor. Okay. Well, you can basically reverse that if you know your recovery factor and you know what you produced. You can back out the OIP, and once you have the OIP, all you have to do is subtract your EUR or QM, depending on what you use current conditions or future conditions, and that's your refrac EUR. So those are two numbers you really need. And with all this base, all you're doing is back calculating from this. And it's not going to give you any, the way to get a much better number is to do the full analysis that we talk about in 2662, the Urtech paper. But if you don't have that information, for instance, or if you, Eagle for, for, for Eaglewood especially, because Eagleford has got really poor well log coverage and very high heterogeneity. So, I mean, for the Eagleford screening, this is the Eagleford liquids. Now, for gas, it's different because of the gas numbers, gas condensate. And again, you're dealing with all gas on the reservoir side. So, you have to deal with you know, basically it's gas in place and uh, MCF equivalents produced and all that. You don't, you can't really use, uh, you know, yeah, you can't use this curve for the Eagleford condensate window. Now, you can for the, for the, uh, the liquids window. We've seen Again, we did one where we showed around 12% uh, with close, close with engineered completions out in here. So uh, we've got some confirmation that we have similar numbers. Again, both of these areas, liquids rich areas in Eagleford and Permian, uh, if you look at a solution gas drive tight well in those areas, they're going to have a 15% recovery factor. Typically, that's you know you know not, not a shale, but then again, if a shale has 100% SRV, you ought to see around 15% theoretically. Uh, and that's the that's what gives us more confidence that the high end is good, and then all you have to do is get a confidence in the low end. But that's that's where that comes from. Uh, Great. It's not gonna be exact, but it'll be a, it'll be a uh, it'll be a conservative case, which you know. Thanks, Bob. And okay. uh, just a point of clarification that the 3.5 million dollars is the AFP cost for the entire completion job, including the expandable. Right. Right. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Later today, you will receive a link to the recording of the webinar, an evaluation form, and a link to register for Bob's class, Refract Candidate Selection, Execution, and Performance Evaluation, which is scheduled in the live online format. Uh, those are half days, April 13th and 14th, or full days in Houston in July and in Midland in November. Thanks very much for attending today. Goodbye.